summer can be a bit of a slog. For us, it's often for some reason a rather busy time, and I'm sure we're not alone. Well, you can beat the summertime sadness and the August angst and enhance your everyday with our excellent sponsor, Via Hemp. This is a company that crafts award-winning premium THC and THC-free gummies. Each of these gummies is especially designed to cultivate a specific mood. Whether you're looking to get relaxed, get quality sleep, get creative, or just to get focused. If you're 21 or older, you can experience it for yourself and get 15% off your first order with our exclusive code MSHEET at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. I personally enjoyed their grapefruit flow state gummies. This CBG and CBD powerhouse really helped me tap into my productivity. Like, we have had an extremely busy summer, and I feel Flow State got me over the finish line a few times. When I was editing multiple episodes a day, digging through documents, and knocking out a bunch of interviews. Biohemp does not require a medical card, and it ships legally to all 50 states. It's also affordable, and even more so for Murder Sheet listeners who get a special deal. If you're 21 and older, head to viahemp.com and use code MSHEET to receive 15% off. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P dot com and use code MSHEET at checkout. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Enhance your everyday with Via. This season, Instacart has your back-to-school. As in, they've got your back-to-school lunch favorites, like snack packs and fresh fruit. And they've got your back-to-school supplies, like backpacks, binders, and pencils. And they've got your back when your kid casually tells you they have a huge school project due tomorrow. Let's face it, we were all that kid. So first call your parents to say I'm sorry, and then download the Instacart app to get delivery in as fast as 30 minutes all school year long. Get a $0 delivery fee for your first three orders while supplies last. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Okay, it's time to commit. 2024 is the year for prioritizing yourself. Begin your new smile journey with Byte, and you could start seeing results in just two to three weeks. Just order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Byte clear liners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces, plus they offer financing options, accept eligible insurance, and you could pay with your HSA, FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of the murder of two girls. So there have been a lot of filings recently in the ongoing uh, Richard Allen case, of course, the Delphi murders case. We had been uh, holding off on covering them because we were waiting for the contempt ruling to come down, and that has come down too. So we have a lot to cover today, and we will. And also just a quick programming note, because of... This particular episode is not going to be a cheat sheet this week, but there would definitely be one. I have it on excellent authority. There would be a cheat sheet next week. But for this week, this uh, episode is going to focus on the new Delphi filings. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is the Delphi murders, the contempt ruling, the fourth Frank's motion, a request for further sanctions, and more. There's a lot of filings that we're going to talk about today. 
Yes, that title that, that uh, Anya wrote the title for this episode, that, that was a real uh, mouthful. Yeah, I always want to be accurate. I never want to be too flashy and like, ooh, you know, but I, I feel in this situation, I, it's I, I said, let's just call it more filings. Yeah. People would know. <laughs> Lots of filings. Let's start out with the fourth Frank's notice. Tell us about it. Well, I mean, this is number four. This is, you know, I mean, we're, we're getting into Fast and Furious uh, franchise levels here where we're we're just seeing again and again and again they're going back to um the franks you know kind of a strategy franks gets into <clears throat> the defense arguing uh the police have lied or omitted something and therefore evidence should be dismissed based on that so it's a perfectly valid strategy what kind of nags at me with this one a little bit and and kevin let me know if you think i'm being fair it's just kind of interesting let's set aside any of the factual claims let's set aside any of the validity of the claims it just seems odd to me that we're on number four this has never worked and they keep doing it when it seems like maybe they could you know they've gone through other methods to get other evidence suppressed that seems like maybe that would be worth it but with the Franks, it just seems like this is not really working out for them. And they, and yet they keep doing it. So I'm just kind of interested. I mean, obviously, there's benefits of making a record. But again and again, in response filings from the state, it's been kind of called into question whether or not this even raises to Franks or whether it even raises to improper behavior on the part of police. So I, I guess it's it's kind of weird for me to see this again. Number four. Number four. Ma- Mambo number four. I just, I don't know. I, why, would, why would they do this? I guess they're trying to create a record. Uh, they spent a lot of time and energy in this one still talking about Turco, still saying uh, we should have been told about Professor Turco's name uh, a few days or perhaps a few weeks earlier than we were. I also thought it was interesting regarding Turco can uh you read paragraph 5b absolutely quote purdue professor jeffrey turco wrote in a report provided to unified command that the markings referred to the configuration of the branches on the girls bodies constitute an inscription inspired by norse runes or modern recreations thereof is quite plausible so that (laughs) seems to be a bit of a step back because earlier Certainly the impression I believe they were trying to create was that Turco supported the idea that this this is pretty definitely runes. And now they're saying Turco is saying, well, it's plausible that maybe it could be. It's rune inspired. That's a, yeah, I mean, that that's a pretty giant leap backwards, frankly. But I mean, even even if they don't intend it in that way. I guess I wouldn't want to bring up the guy that I trotted out there in filings and acted like this guy is my star guy. He's my rune guy. He's going to come out and talk about this and then have him be like, you're you're totally lying about what I said. The state police had it right. You have a completely wrong. What are you doing? I wouldn't want to mention his name again in this whole thing. So I guess it sort of confuses me at why they are. (laughs) I mean, th- this was all an unnecessary own goal. Don't remind us about it. I mean, I-, I saw Turco in this and I like flinched. It's like, what are they doing? It was surprising. Uh, the heart of this one seems to be about the phone. Before we get to that, I think you highlighted that you thought you saw some stuff in here that gave us some uh, little details about the night of the disappearance. <sighs> yeah, the night of the disappearance of the girls. So they, they go missing in the afternoon of February 13th, 2017. The search is ongoing. A lot of people may not realize, but the search, uh, as far as our understanding, went on late, late, late into the night, unofficially. It was officially called off at midnight, but that didn't mean people left. They were still looking. It just, for legal reasons, it was unofficial. And we learn in this document that Steve Mullen, the then Delphi police chief, who is now an investigator for Nick McClellan's Carroll County Prosecutor's Office, contacted Sergeant Mitch Blocker of the Indiana State Police. Apologies to this man if I sent his name wrong um, at, at 9 p.m. on the night of their disappearance. And he asked for, quote, precise location information from a cell phone using some of their more technical assets 
And then the defense says that the last communication with the sergeant was prior to 1 a.m. on February 14th. I just kind of and this doesn't matter really for what we're talking about, but it just it was interesting to me because it does show that there was ongoing efforts through the night to figure out where they were. This is before it was even known to be a murder, obviously. Yeah, it, so that is uh, an interesting detail, and thanks for highlighting that. Yeah, sure. Have you ever covered a carpet stain with a rug? Ignored a leaky faucet? Pretended your half-painted living room is supposed to look like that? Well, you're not alone. We've all got unfinished home projects. But there is an easier way. Thumbtack is the app that makes it easier to care for your home. Pull out your phone and in just a few taps, search, chat, and book highly rated pros right in your neighborhood. Download Thumbtack and start caring for your home the easier way. This episode is sponsored by AutoTrader. Credit scores, down payments, interest rates, car buying can be a numbers game. But you don't have to be a math expert to get the keys to your dream car. Just use Kelly Blue Book My Wallet on AutoTrader. Crunch your numbers and get your personalized results so you know exactly how much you'll pay each month for your car. It's like having a magic wand for your wallet. Presto! The car you've been wanting is now within reach. So hit the road and leave your calculator at home. Find your next car on autotrader.com. What makes a life a good one? Is it the adventure you have? Or the friends you find along the way? Maybe it's pursuing your passion while striving to protect, defend, and save what you believe in every single day. So what makes a life a good one? In the Coast Guard, we think it's all of the above and more. But you'll have to find out for yourself. Visit GoCoastGuard.com to learn more. I guess if we're going to get to the next kind of... So this phone thing. Yeah. Uh, my inclination is instead of reading this, why don't I try to summarize it? All right. So they they say that uh, Mullen talked to someone with the state police, and they indicated that they'd heard from AT and T that the phone, which we're assuming is Liberty German's phone, was as of uh, five forty four p.m either not in the area or not in a working condition. And then they say, well, we've gotten some information since then that indicates that the, the phone was pinging at different times throughout that night and following morning. And so this suggests that things aren't adding up and maybe the prosecution's theory is inaccurate. Is, so first of all, before I even move on from there, is that your understanding of what their argument is? Yes. And I'm going to say this caveat. I think this may be the most unclearly written Frank's motion we've gotten yet. Yes. That's so, why I'm having to ask you to make sure I'm interpreting this correctly. I think that that at times I'm 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 truly baffled at how this is written because it is a to me a departure from some of the more clear clear language that we've had in past Frank's motions, and it kind of feels like a rush job, frankly. Well, and, and we know it was because some of this phone information, uh, they say they just got last week, and so then they rushed this out. So my, my first reaction to this is, yeah, it, it does seem like a rush job. And number two, we know in the past that they have made some mistakes about technology, Yeah, more particularly when they were did a legal document about geofencing. It turned out they didn't really understand the topic. And so that made me wonder, is it possible they don't really understand how pinging a phone works? And I think that is possible. And I say that with a caveat. It's also possible that I don't understand how pinging a phone Fair. works. Fair. We are not technical wizards over here at the murder sheet. But I did do a bit of research online. Uh, Kim Commando, among others, uh, seems to indicate that an iPhone, when an iPhone's battery is dead for you and me, the battery is not completely dead. So there's still a little bit of power in there. And so because of that, even if you're not able to use your phone and the battery is gone, uh, find my phone features still work and a phone can still be pinged. 
And so if my understanding of that is correct, the fact that the phone is pinging throughout the night uh, does not contradict with the idea that the phone is no longer in a usable state earlier in the afternoon. And, and just to be clear, Kim Commando is a radio host. She hosts the Kim Commando show as well as Consumer Tech Update and Digital Life Hack. She's she focuses on consumer technology. So that's why we're citing her. She's not, you know, right. this is something that she, you know, her shows kind of delve into. So, I mean, listen, there seems to me we don't understand technology. Um, we we know in the past the defense hasn't understood technology. It's possible that they're on to something really big here and it's a big deal. But it's also possible that they just don't know what they're talking about because that's happened before. So I, I, I think this is something I'd put a pin in and and see where it goes. Yeah, so I have a little bit of skepticism. Uh, we'll see what happens. As I say, it doesn't really seem like there's necessarily a contradiction between those two things. I completely agree. Is that essentially all to the, I mean, that's pretty much the crux of the Frank's motion. That is pretty much the crux of this fourth Frank's motion. (laughs) And of the four, I would say this one seemed the weakest. Yeah. Which is like shocking that it beat out some of the other ones, frankly, you know, I mean, but we are like weeks away from trial. What's the next one? The next one is accused reply to the state's response to motion to compel and sanctions and requests for the state of Indiana to be further sanctioned for providing false information in its response. That was a lot. (laughs) So long title. Anya loves the long titles. Basically, though, what this one is about is about uh, Todd Click. Yeah. Or that, that's that's what a big part of it is about. It's a lot about Todd Click. Now let's just because I like to introduce people again. I know you probably know, but Todd Click is the former assistant police chief of Rushville, Indiana. He is essentially a star witness for the defense. He is one of the three investigators who looked into the Odinist angle early on. It's unclear at this time the sort of level of his role in this, uh, but essentially he was working with state police trooper Kevin Murphy. And um, the FBI counterterrorism task force member and Terre Haute police officer Greg Ferency on this angle. So we know that they came into it first. They seemingly brought him into it. What his role was, what exactly, I'm sure that'll become more clear at trial. But he's very important for the defense. And the defense has been saying, oh, they had a bunch of information from Todd Click that they didn't really give to us until much later. And in response, the prosecution said, well, actually, the stuff that Todd Click gave us was essentially summaries and stuff and repetition of information that was contained in police reports, which, in fact, had already been provided to the defense. So they already had all of this. And in this filing, I thought it was interesting. uh, The defense does not really refute McClellan's assertion that much of the click information was contained in other reports. They do say that there, the Todd click apparently did have some other information that maybe the prosecution did not have. And according to this filing, the prosecution received this information on or about August 30th, 2023 and then they turned that information over to the defense on uh, September 8th, 2023. And so that is uh, a relatively quick turnaround for that bit of information. Yes, especially given that they're all drowning in discovery. So, yeah, that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess also with click. At one point, the defense says, quote, It is hard to imagine a more exculpatory type of letter than one in which an investigator is courageous enough to detail that he and two other investigators believe the prosecution may have accused the wrong man. Click's fearlessness also involved going to the lengths of hiring a a lawyer to proactively steer the prosecution toward the actual killers and away from possible injustice against an innocent man. But of course, a person's a person's opinion is not exculpatory exculpatory evidence. Well, I mean, listen, if if Todd Click wrote them a letter saying I am in possession of a video that shows Richard Allen did not go to the trails that day. He just made that part up. So you know, th- that that could be exculpatory. If Todd Click writes them a letter saying, 
I my the vibe I'm getting is that he's not guilty. That doesn't matter. Who cares? And like I don't know what the letter says, so we can't assess it. But it would have to reach a level to be exculpatory. Exactly. Now, again, if if Todd Click's entitled to his opinion, he's entitled to come in and say, here's what I, I think happened. Um, it's not it's not saying that he's not important or that he won't be important for the defense. That all can be true. But it's just saying that what the defense is the defense's problem, I think, in this case has been often a mismatch between what they're asking for and what actually happened. You know, something can be good for the defense and and not really need to result in any relief. In this situation, they're specifically act, asking for sanctions against the state for things that just when you're reading their own filing don't sound like they amount to that. You know, and you could say, like, look, it's great that you got Todd Click. Now you can have a sort of a law enforcement expert who's who's speaking for your case. But you don't that doesn't necessarily mean that the prosecution is guilty of hiding discovery, especially since a letter where you're stating your opinion is is not some exculpatory piece of evidence, it, especially, I mean, if they'd, if the prosecution had hid all the Odinist stuff, well, maybe you could make an argument, but they already had this stuff. So what, already had the stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it, Kevin. Uh, to, to me, there's a, a subtext to a lot of this from, uh, I, 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 I believe the subtext is that the prosecution law enforcement, however you want to characterize them, that they, at least in their minds, thoroughly investigated this particular angle relatively early on and decided there was nothing to it and moved on. So if they were slow to respond to Click's letter or things like that, perhaps it was because there was nothing in there they didn't already know and hadn't already considered. It it's a it's a matter of the prosecution and the defense and the law enforcement not believing it's a good theory is not the same thing as them covering it up. You know, they're allowed to say, we don't feel that there's probable cause here. We don't think these men are guilty. We've essentially cleared them. And this is a tenuous theory at best. That that doesn't mean they didn't consider it. And I'm not really seeing a lot of evidence at this point that the defense is putting out that they were negligent in how they got to that point. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't... I don't... It just feels like the defense is continuing to like just slam against a brick wall here. And it's, I just, I think sometimes it's better to play things closer to the vest because then you can bring out uh, a click as kind of an, a, you know, a nice, oh, here's a, here's a good witness instead of like at this point, we've really picked apart a lot of the click stuff. And, and it's frankly just seemed to raise more questions um, as far as what the defense is even saying. And there's more tur- Turco stuff. Are we done with click? Should we go to Turco now? There's a little bit of Turco. Yeah, why not throw Turco in? Why not throw the guy who said you lied into all of your recent filings? That's a great idea. Wouldn't you just be like, never talk about that man again? It's a, yeah, it, yeah. It, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I would go near that topic again. I, if we can say maybe there was a misunderstanding between the defense and Turco, that's something, just don't go back there. Uh, shocking to me that they're still trying to make an issue of him. And... Um, you know, I, I think what they're alleging here is like basically that the prosecution has been really late in handing over evidence, which can be a real issue. Discovery issues can derail a case. If a prosecutor improperly conceals exculpatory evidence from the defense in a case that can get dismissed, overturned. It's a it's a very egregious issue. Um. But when when the defense is outlining some of this, it sort of becomes, frankly, faintly ridiculous because the defense themselves in previous filings has said things to the effect of like, well, we may have not gotten them or we might not just be able to find it, but we did get them. And the prosecution should hold our hands throughout the whole thing. And so the issue with making late stage turnovers from the prosecution is some sort of gotcha is that. McClelland has made it clear in his filings that he has been frequently doing the defense's jobs for them by holding their hands through the discovery process, giving them stuff that they're specifically asking for, even though he doesn't have to do that if he's already given it to them, and helping them find stuff. So it's like he's going above and beyond here, and they're still complaining about it. It just 
I think it makes them look ridiculous, like they don't have a grasp of their own discovery. Granted, it's an enormous amount of discovery, but you know what? Maybe focus on that instead of like talking to YouTubers constantly. That might be an idea. Why don't you read paragraphs 24 and 25? Quote, the defense posits this question, if it is complicated and time-consuming for the prosecution to dive into 26 terabytes of information and requires searching through several files before just a few documents or pieces of evidence can be found, and this is the prosecution's evidence, then how can the prosecution expect the defense to locate the items it seeks without assistance from the prosecution? The defense did not organize the discovery. Prosecution organized the discovery during the defense's first tenure on the case, then reorganized slash formatted it for the defense's second tenure on the case. Richard Allen and his lawyers have only reached out to the prosecution after they had spent several hours searching for documents throughout the state of Indiana's convoluted, disorganized, and often untimely discovery dumps. Okay, so they're basically admitting, like, they just don't want to... <laughs> they just don't know where anything is. I'm, I, this is not the prosecution's problem. And I, I think it's completely outrageous. Part of the reason that... Uh, part of the things that uh, attorneys are paid for is to uh, familiarize yourself with the case. This is why they give you all the big bucks, okay? This is why... This is This is what you're literally supposed to do. They have large staffs at this point helping them. They have an extra lawyer. They should be, they should know where, and I'm not even saying this because I'm offended on Nick McClellan's behalf. I'm offended on Richard Allen's behalf. How do you not know where stuff is at this point? We are weeks out from trial. You know, you have had months. I'm sorry. I know they got kicked off. That must have disrupted things for them. So, I mean, in that case, I understand there was a period where they were, Certainly behind the eight ball on this, but we are they're back now and they chose to go for a speedy trial, even though it's very clear to me that they don't know where anything is at this point, <laughs> that there's there's still like surprises. And, and that is not where you want to be going into an important trial like this, where your your client's life is on the line in the sense that he could go to prison forever if you mess this up. And you know what? You know how you mess things up? You don't know where anything is and you and you're too busy courting YouTubers to actually figure it out. I mean, I I, like, I, I would be concerned about the state of preparation for the trial at this point. Everything has just been a red flashing. This is going to be a problem as far as I'm concerned. And I mean, there's no point in sugarcoating it at this point because it's it's May 1st. This thing is supposed to go on in May 13th. You know, and, and and the recent filings do not give me much confidence here. And you know what? Richard Allen deserves strenuous, strenuous lawyering. If if I were Richard Allen or someone close to Richard Allen and I wanted a trial, I would want uh, the trial to be with a vigorous, prepared defense. And I have concerns about that. And I say if he wants a trial because we, we get all of these accounts of him confessing over and over again. And if a man is confessing to a terrible crime with such frequency, at some point you need to ask yourself, does this person want a trial? Does this person want to plead it out? I mean, I'm genuinely concerned about that from the perspective of We've talked about this, but William Labrado, his former uh, counsel, has talked in the media about how Richard Allen is, you know, was was telling him and his co-counsel, um, Robert Scrimmon, that he thought he was going to have to pay for them if they continued on, which was not true. I mean, they were public defenders. So was he getting bad information from somebody that essentially mislead him into wanting Baldwin and Rosie back? And if so, who was giving him that information? Or another possibility is he he didn't think that he was just trying to be polite in firing Libredo and Scrimmon, essentially. It's not you guys. I, I just don't have to pay for it and just didn't realize how ridiculous that sounded. So, I mean, I don't know, but that is really concerning to me. Because if he's in a position where he wants to just have this over with because that's his wishes, those should be respected. And I, if we, if this was a normal case, I would assume that the, the attorneys and the client were completely on the same page. This is not a normal case. There's been concerning sim signals like that that have happened that make me wonder, I mean, do you need some sort of shadow attorney appointed to just check in with him and say, this is what you want, right? 
Like they're doing what you want. Yeah, the number of confessions is uh, sounds like someone who has, isn't being heard necessarily for one reason or another. Maybe they're not being heard because they're innocent and totally mentally ill, and they're not being treated, or maybe they're not being heard because people people with other agendas want a different outcome. What's the next one? Motion for pretrial hearing. So this is actually a title that's pretty self explanatory. Yeah, I love that. So one thing that jumped out at me is that this date for the trial was set on March 7th, and between March 7th and April 25th, there were no communications from the court to the parties as to any matters associated with the procedural aspects of the jury trial. So for that six, seven weeks, however long it is, the judge is not reaching out to uh, McClelland or uh, Rosie and Baldwin to ask about what sort of parameters they need for a trial, and they're not reaching out to her. That's a little surprising because this case is so complicated. Uh, If I were an attorney on either side of it, if I was the judge overseeing it, I would want to sit down and talk with everybody and try to figure out, okay, how many witnesses are we going to be having? How much time does the defense need in order to fairly present their case? How much time does the prosecution need to fairly present their case? Uh, How much time should we set aside at the end of all of this for each side to have uh, rebuttals, if possible? It would seem like it would make sense for someone to have initiated that process to start having these conversations. Uh, This this, uh, filing creates the impression, and maybe this is wrong, but it creates the impression that this... uh, trial length of two, two and a half weeks was just chosen arbitrarily. And I think one of the big problems with the administration of this case by Judge Gull is that often we don't see uh, a record being created. And I would really like there to be some record at some point indicating that the, the choice for the trial length and such was thought out uh, with relevant information at the time. Could that be established in the next hearing that they're going to have over this? Possibly. A record. Yeah, I mean, that sort of feels like what it might be for. Uh, Gull says uh, that she doesn't know how long the prosecution is going to take to present their case. And uh, it says in here that uh, the pro- the state's original witness list has 118 witnesses and 93 exhibits. The defense's original list contains approximately 71 witnesses. And so that's also an issue. Uh, have you ever been at a, a dinner party where someone comes early and sees a bunch of great desserts and just eats them all and doesn't leave anything for anyone else? What? <laughs> I, I, I think... I think have it, you ever been to one? <laughs> I think in theory, uh, the defense is is raising the issue that something like that could happen here. Then in other words, oh, we just get two, two and a half weeks for this. What if the prosecution takes a week and a half to go through their 118 witnesses? That does that mean that we as the defense just get a few days then because of that? What about rebuttal? Uh, these concerns are, they seem valid because you really need to work this stuff out in a way that's fair for all. You really want to make sure that the prosecution has time to present what they feel is important. And you want to be sure that the defense has time to present what they feel is important. And you don't want to make those decisions arbitrarily. In addition to that, uh, right now there is some contention the defense obviously wants to talk about Odinism at this trial because it is their contention that the crime was actually committed by Odinus and not by Richard Allen. And the prosecution and uh, Judge Gull have said, well, we don't really think that you've proven a connection between Odinus and this crime, so maybe you shouldn't be allowed to do that. And so... If that isn't adjudicated prior to the trial, what the defense can and cannot uh, present, that means the limited time for the trial would have to be further uh, 
used because at different times you would have to stop the trial or at least stop the public part of the trial, have the jury taken out, and then have uh, basically the prosecution and the defense argue about these issues. And perhaps we, we might see witnesses being brought on just to say, well, this is what you would have said in front of a jury if Judge Gold had permitted you to, so that a record would be created. Okay. And so they're saying, so we really need to settle these things before the trial, especially if you want the trial to happen in two, two and a half weeks. That seems reasonable. That seems reasonable to me, too. That's reasonable because it's about creating a record. It's about, okay, uh, Odinism may be hampered or not fully allowed in the trial, but let's allow future courts to check that out and see if it was a good decision or not. Uh, they're also very skeptical that the defense is, uh, I should say, is very skeptical that the trial can be done in two, two and a half weeks. And they reference a previous case Judge Gull had where there were 140 witnesses. And the defense says, well, that particular trial lasted 34 days. And we think that a similar length would be required for this trial. And that would be 34 business days. So if you're only meeting in uh, five days a week, that would be almost seven weeks. Yeah. Or close to two months. That sounds like a a long time. But um, I guess, you know, you want to ask for more than you want, I guess. And, and I, I, I would share the concern that you could go through close to 200 witnesses in uh, two weeks. That seems like a lot. Yeah. For two weeks. It 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 seems like maybe what they're asking for is a lo- a lot, but two weeks might be too little. Maybe somewhere in the middle. <laughs> I don't know, but it seems reasonable to raise some of these concerns because they ultimately deal with logistics that everyone wants to work well for this case. Uh, one interesting thing about this filing is that they include uh, most of an email from Judge Gold that Judge Gold sent to the attorneys. I think when you look at it, it's pretty obvious that a big chunk of that has been redacted. Oh, yeah, huge, huge chunk. But uh, there's also a fair amount of it included. We've we've heard relatively little from Judge Gold in this case, and so this is an opportunity to hear some of her words. Do you, Do you want, want me to read it? Why don't you read it? I'll read it and just note, I'll note where there's a redaction. Across America, BP supports more than 300,000 jobs to keep our energy flowing. Jobs like expanding our biodiesel capacity in Washington state and reducing operational emissions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. So this is an email from Sunday, April 28th, 2024 at 1115 a.m. And it seems to be going to uh, Baldwin, McClelland, uh, Luttrell, um, James Luttrell, uh, Jennifer Diener. Those are two other members of the prosecution team. Um, not Jennifer Diener, I guess. Uh, oh, Jennifer OJ and uh, I think it's Sharon Diener. So this is from Judge Gull. Quote. Good morning. I will answer your questions as follows. Redacted for a while. Quote, the intent is that the jury selection will take three days. Court will be in session in Allen County beginning at 830 a.m. and concluding when we conclude for the day. You've all been provided with the sub panel lists broken into morning and afternoon sessions. I will forward to you under separate email the seating charts for courtroom one and the strike sheets we will be using for selection. The selected jurors will be sworn in upon selection in order to not speak or communicate with anyone about the case and to conduct no research on the case. They will further be ordered to return to the Allen County Courthouse on Thursday morning with their luggage and personal effects, which will be searched by law enforcement officers to ensure they're bringing nothing electronic or illegal. Once that is complete, they will be transported to their hotels by my staff. The order I referenced above contemplates an invitation to the media to meet with me in the Carroll County courtroom Thursday afternoon so that they can take photographs of the empty courtroom and B-roll footage of the courtroom for their stories and broadcasts and to perceive their press credentials. This case was set as a speedy trial at the request of the defendant for May 13th through 31st, 2024. That is the length of the trial, not more or less. 
when the order was issued, no, not one attorney notified the court that the length of the trial was insufficient. In fact, it is consistent with the previously scheduled length in January 2024. I intend to start court every morning by 9 a.m. and recess for the day around 5 to 6 p.m. Court will be in session on Saturday, perhaps for the entire day if necessary. Court will be in recess on Sunday to allow the jurors and parties to rest. I have tried death penalty and life without parole cases in this amount of time, all of them with multiple victims. I am unaware of how many witnesses the prosecution intends to call, nor on how long their case will take to present. The defense is claiming it will take a couple of weeks to present this case, its case. I am unsure what exactly the defense intends to present. I am quite familiar with the law regarding third-party perpetrators, and unless the defense can provide a nexus between any alleged third-party perpetrators and the charged crimes, those allegations are unsupported and will be inadmissible. Please be prepared to present your cases sim- timely. Have your witnesses available quickly and promptly. I look with disfavor on counsel attempting to manipulate the presentation of evidence by timing witnesses poorly. That conduct will not be permitted. The juror's time is valuable, especially since they are sequestered and away from their homes, families, and jobs. Please respect the sacrifice the jurors are making. Judge Gull. Uh, any comments on that? Or do you want to just move on to the next one? Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how all this goes. <laughs> I guess it's my, <laughs> I don't know. What's the next filing? All right. The next filing in the list is, I guess, would be motion for leave of court to subpoena third party records. Again, not necessarily a title that gives away much, but what this is, is that Nick McClellan wants to have recordings of Richard Allen's phone calls from prison. Now, what's really interesting about this is you're like, well, yeah, he made incriminating statements to his wife and mother on a recorded phone call in Westville. But McClellan wants all of Allen's phone calls. And this is a quote, and these these would be a subpoena to a company called Via Path Technologies, which I guess is a contractor with the Indiana Department of Corrections. So it would be the one holding all of these, I guess, recordings. So the quote is, quote, any and all phone calls made by inmate Richard Allen while he was housed at Westville Correctional Facility and Wabash Correctional Facility, both of which are part of the Indiana Department of Corrections. And, uh, quote, during his incarceration, Richard Allen made several phone calls from the two facilities. During some of those phone calls, he made statements that the state intends to use at trial as evidence in the case. The phone calls are kept by a third party party via path technologies. They are the keeper of the records for the phone calls made by inmates housed in the Indian Department of Corrections. So there's more than one phone call if there's one, at least one from Wabash Valley, as well as the Westville one we already knew about. So this raises the issue of uh, yet more incriminating statements slash confessions from uh, Richard Allen. Yeah, that's that. That does not bode well for him if there's anything to that. Uh, next one. Next, next document. One. Do it. Defen- what is it? All right. It's the defendant's response to state's motion in limine and request for hearing. So, yeah. What is so there, there's some duplication yeah. here. Uh, again, they're saying, well, basically, uh, we think there should be a hearing to discuss this motion in limine stuff instead of waiting until the trial. Okay. That's, that's the basic gist and of that, it. Will that be grouped into May 7th? I believe that's what the May 7th one is Yeah, about. that's what May 7th is. So, May, is, But it, will they do other things on May 7th, or is it pretty much just this? I will uh, look while you uh, keep on talking so, so there will be no awkwardness. Uh, <laughs> no, I think that's a, that's a ship that sailed for our show a long time ago. Um, I think the last thing, though, before we get into, I think, what we're going to conclude with is – Defendant's notice of submission of supplemental witness and exhibit list to the state. So this is the defense saying, here's another witness list and what we're going to use as exhibits. Now, this is filed uh, in a way that the witness list does not – it is it is not appearing to the public or anything like that. So we don't know who's on their wit- the witness list, and that will be something we find out later. Defendant's motion for pretrial hearing and state's motion in limine set for hearing in the Allen Superior Court, May 7th, 2024. Okay. So there you go. That's what we know. Uh, so the final thing is we got uh, Judge Gull's ruling on the contempt. 
big picture is that she uh, did not hold uh, Rosie and Baldwin in contempt, although she certainly uh, is critical of their behavior. I'm going to read this because it's short and I think it would be good for people to sort of hear it. Read it. Quote, the court having had this matter under advisement following a hearing conducted on March 18th, 2024, and having reviewed the evidence admitted at the hearing, the court did not review any evidence that was offered but not admitted. The arguments of counsel and the briefs and memorandums submitted by counsel now finds that the state proved by a preponderance of the evidence that the defense counsel was sloppy, negligent, and incompetent in their handling of discovery materials. Counsel failed to properly secure evidence and discovery material in this matter. Counsel negligently allowed their discovery outline to be sent to an individual unrelated to this matter, Brandon Woodhouse, who then disseminated that information to the public. Counsel further allowed their discovery materials to be compromised by Westerman, who in turn provided the information to Fortson and Cohen. Counsel has described Westerman both as a criminal and a valued consultant and confidant. Despite this court's findings of sloppiness, negligence, and incompetence, the state is required to prove that counsel's conduct was willful and intentional beyond a reasonable doubt for the court to find counsel in contempt. As the state has not met that burden, the court declines to find them in contempt of court for violating the protective order issued February 17, 2023, regarding discovery. The state has also alleged that defense counsel violated the gag order issued by the court on December 2, 2022. Defense counsel issued a press release on December 1st, 2022. The release contained statements that are potentially violative of the rules of professional conduct. As the defense counsel's counsel correctly argues in his post-hearing brief, the gag order was not yet issued. As such, the court declines to find counsel in contempt of court as no order was in place. To the extent that the press release violated the rules of professional responsibility, the trial court has no jurisdiction to enforce those rules. As required by the rules of professional responsibility, the trial court will therefore send a copy of this order and the press release to the Office of Judicial and Attorney Regulation, Executive Director Adrian Myring, for that office to enforce the rules or determine the counsel's ethical misconduct. Dated April 30th, 2024, Francis Seagull, Special Judge, Carroll County Circuit Court, Carroll County, Indiana. End quote. So no, no contempt. And what do you make of that? Uh, certainly she's critical and certainly she's saying, well, maybe someone else should look at this instead of me. But, uh, yeah, no contempt. Incompetent, sloppy, (coughs) uh, contempt didn't get there beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Didn't get the, what, what cinches that it sounds like is, uh, Andrew Baldwin standing up on camera and saying, you know what we should do today? (laughs) Leak this stuff all over the place. You need that intent. And to be clear, we don't have that. No, no one, no one does it. Basically, you can't just have smoke. You need fire. And so I find it interesting. I know that a lot of more of the, I guess, virulent pro defense crowd, as far as the online contingent of Delphi followers goes, is very, very anti gull. There's this perception that she's out to get the defense attorneys and is, you know, doing this and that. I mean, this sort of does fly in the face of that ongoing theory, it seems like. Because one would think that somebody who was just purely out to get a, a party in this case would use this opportunity to get them. Yes. <laughs> right? Right. I wonder if she has an eye on that to a certain degree. An eye on appeals. She might. Kind of like clear clear the pathway for this trial, basically. The trial is what matters, not whatever grievances are happening here. Yeah, certainly, even though she doesn't find them in contempt, uh, no one likes to be told their work is sloppy and incompetent. Basically, you're terrible at your jobs, but did you do something that I can find in contempt? No, No. not with the evidence presented. So it's definitely a blow to their reputations, I think, but it's not not the same as, you know, you you purposely did this. I mean, that's what it seems like. You need to prove intent. Well, it's been an interesting uh, <laughs> flurry of documents coming out recently. Hopefully, this helped you kind of kind of go through them. I think Kevin and I find it helpful to talk to each other about this stuff beforehand. So hopefully, 
you all feel it's helpful to kind of hear from us and just kind of go through them one by one. We obviously have an you know opinions on on different things that we share with you, but you don't have to agree with us. You can always have your own opinion, and and certainly that's in a complicated case like this. There's so much room for disagreement that it's it's definitely um it's good to to do that to kind of go back and forth. But I think we're just going to be looking for what's next at this point, right, Kevin? That's right. And it sounds like the next thing is a hearing next week and uh, a trial the week after. There we go. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.